us 21st century humans have come up with an awful lot of entertaining ways of filling up the few free moments in our overscheduled lives. We sing and dance, we surf and ski, we cavort and canoodle and watch TV. But what diversion do we love most of all? Man, oh man, we love to spend. Now, some folks say our obsession with shopping reflects a certain decadence, a certain self-indulgence. But I say every time we whip out a piece of plastic and slap it down to buy some fresh bling bling, we're taking part in a noble tradition, the evolution of capitalism. But now a new phase of capitalism is upon us, the age of e-commerce, an age that's changed the way the business works, the way we buy and sell, an age ushered in by a transformative technology, the World Wide Web, and by two of its seminal companies, Amazon.com and eBay. It's easy to forget just how revolutionary these companies were when they first burst upon the scene back in the 1990s, how they shook big business to its very core. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, corporations have always been based on the power of high-flying executives sitting in their gilded offices way up there with the consumer almost as an afterthought. But now Amazon and eBay were creating a whole new model of commerce, one based on taking the internet and harnessing the power of the great mass of individuals down here at street level. My name is John Heileman, and as a journalist, I've covered the e-commerce revolution from the start. Hanging around with the guys and gals who made it happen. The story I'm here to tell you is about the high-tech innovations that underpin that revolution and about the enormous economic upheaval that it unleashed. It's a story of a boom, a bubble, a bust, and a resurrection. And it's a story that helps explain why, despite what we may think, even the worst financial meltdowns are incredibly, amazingly, and unexpectedly a good thing for all of us. It's almost a cliche, but if you're searching for the next big thing in high tech, the best place to look is a garage. Ah, yes, the almighty garage. The place where, according to high tech lore, the greatest startups were incubated. Hewlett Packard, Apple, the list goes on and on. The garage we're interested in today was the birthplace of Amazon.com. It was in suburban Seattle and belonged to a guy named Jeff Bezos. Bezos started out on Wall Street in the early 1990s. He was highly analytical, a spreadsheet junkie. And when the web came along, he started thinking in a systematic way about its unique properties and what kinds of stuff it would be ideal for selling. He made list after list, and always at the top was books. There are millions of books active and in print around the world, and you could build something online that just couldn't exist any other way. There's no way to have a physical bookstore with millions of titles. Bezos launched Amazon in the summer of 1995. Around the same time, down in Silicon Valley, another young guy, Pierre Omidyar, was thinking hard about the web too. Today, Omidyar is a multi-billionaire, but back then he was just another idealistic software programmer, but one who had an interesting idea, the idea that would become eBay. In the beginning, Pierre Omidyar and Jeff Bezos shared one thing in common. They thought of the web as a place to do business and not just goof around. But apart from that, Pierre was from Venus and Jeff was from Mars. They couldn't have been more different. Where Jeff was about the business plan, the market research, the methodical analysis, Pierre, well, he didn't have a business plan. He hadn't done any market research. He was just a humble software coder who thought that the idea of making an online auction site sounded pretty cool. It was an idea that he could take care of all by himself, tapping away at his home computer. I thought that you could maybe use the web uh, and use the power of this technology to, to bring people in one place to create a marketplace, a market mechanism, that was actually truly efficient, where regular people could compete on a level playing field with the big, big players. And so that's really, that's what I set out to do with eBay. Omidyar believed that an auction site on the web would be fairer and more accessible than any existing market. So he decided to make it happen all by himself over one long holiday weekend in September 1995. So I sat down over Labor Day weekend in my sort of home office there and I started writing code, and it was, it was really simple. You could, you could create an item, you could list an item, you could get a list of all the items that had been created, and then you could bid on an item. 
It was just those three things, and, uh, and I was ready to go. <laughs> As the first visitors started trickling into a mid-year site, the pickings they found there were mighty slim. A bunch of computer-related stuff, plus an extremely random assortment of items. Autographed celebrity underwear, a toy fire engine, a superhero lunchbox. I mean, my God, does this look like the makings of startup glory and transformational business potential, or a pile of useless secondhand junk? If you're thinking the latter, well, that's one more reason why you're not a billionaire, and Pierre Omidyar is. Some measure of success came to Amazon and eBay almost immediately. Within months of launching his site, Omidyar was earning thousands of dollars in fees. And in the first 30 days after Amazon went live, with its first employees sitting at desks made out of doors and sawhorses they'd assembled themselves, the site shipped books to 45 different countries and all 50 U.S. states. A business plan that we had written called for very slow growth. And in fact, we had to kind of rip that business plan up and replan everything because the early customers were uh, really taking on to this service very quickly. We thought it would take a long time for people to kind of you know, change their mindset and, and decide to do online shopping. The early success of Amazon and eBay didn't go unnoticed on Wall Street where certain analysts were startled to discover just how fast the web was spreading. One of the most prominent was Henry Blodgett, who would become one of the poster boys of the boom, and later, one of the scapegoats for the bust. Suddenly the company started putting up incredible numbers, quarter after quarter, and the traffic growth was so far beyond what anything anyone had ever mentioned to me. It was literally astounding to look at it and say, how could it be growing this quickly? How quickly? Well, consider this. After the invention of radio, it took 38 years before 50 million people were using it. With TV, it took 13 years. But once the internet was opened up to the general public, it took just four years before it had 50 million users. This was explosive growth for sure, but what was driving it? Well, to answer that, we need to get a little bit geeky. We have to understand the collision of two technologies and the pair of laws that made them unique in the history of mankind. The first technology was the silicon chip, governed by what's called Moore's Law. Coined by Intel co-founder Gordon Moore more than 40 years ago, Moore's Law states that the speed and power of integrated circuits, from microprocessors to memory chips, doubles every 18 months. Now, your first reaction to that might be, so what? The point of doubling is that if you look over time, at how many steps of doubling it takes to get a preposterously large number. You don't need that many steps. So for example, to go from one to a million, you only need 20 steps. And so in very few steps, you get tremendous growth. This logic defying doubling stems from engineers' ability to make transistors smaller and smaller. And it's why computers have gone from giant machines that fill up entire rooms, to super powerful laptops, in what amounts to the blink of an eye any number of innovations that have gone into making transistors smaller. They range from uh, how you etch the transistors onto the surface of silicon to what materials we actually make the transistors out of. What Moore understood when he came up with his law was something about engineers. That the first thing they do with each generation of denser chips is use them to make, wouldn't you know it, even denser chips. The process, in other words, is autocatalytic, meaning self-accelerating. Once he made that declaration, it was almost a, a rule to live by for microprocessor designers. They felt obligated to sort of deliver on whatever technology improvements were needed to make transistors small enough to provide the doubling. But Moore's law is only half of the story behind the technological miracle of the web. The other half is a rule known as Metcalfe's law, coined by Robert Metcalfe, inventor of Ethernet. Metcalfe's law says that every new node, meaning something like your computer, that's added to the network doesn't just increase the network's value by plus one, the curve is much, much steeper than that. It's the Moore's law of connectivity, and this is how it works. If we have two users, then that's one connection between them. They can each talk to each other. So let's add another user. If we have three users, then that gets you three possible connections. If we go to adding another user, that gets you six connections. So we're seeing some growth here. Let's jump up a little bit more. If you go to 10 users, there are actually 45 
possible connections between pairs of users. So notice that the growth is quite steep, in fact. And in fact, if you go to 100 users, by that point, it turns out that there are almost 5,000 possible pairs of users who could choose to communicate with one another. And so what this really means for the growth of the internet is that the internet gathers momentum as it goes, which is to say, as the number of users increases, the usefulness of the network increases, and it becomes even more compelling over time for new users to join the network. By the middle of the 1990s, Moore's Law and Metcalfe's Law were working hand in hand, fueling an upward spiral. Faster, cheaper, more powerful PCs were increasingly connected together, making the network exponentially more useful and exponentially more popular. Though the folks on Wall Street didn't have a clue about how all this technology worked, they could see that this internet thing was really taking off turning into a bona fide mass medium, which meant that there was a killing to be made. And when ignorance meets rampant enthusiasm and unbridled greed, well, you know what that means. It means that a fantastic financial bubble is just around the corner. History tells us that every great wave of transformative innovation is accompanied by a financial mania. The most famous example is the railway frenzy that gripped America and Britain in the mid-1800s. Around the same time, there was a riot of speculation around the telegraph. Fifty years earlier, there had been one around canals. Fifty years later, Ford's Model T ushered in an automobile bubble. In every instance, the pattern was the same. A breakthrough technology creates scads of risky startups. Investors get excited and rush in to buy a piece of the future. And then it all ends in tears bankruptcies, foreclosures, stock market immolations. Does that sound familiar to you? Of course it does, for it describes exactly what happened in the 1990s with the internet. The cycle began in 1995, when Netscape launched its improbable and wildly successful initial public offering on the stock market. A year later came the IPOs of search engine companies such as Yahoo and Excite. And a year after that, it was time for Jeff Bezos to take the next step and pushing the web boom in the direction of bubblehood. The Amazon IPO took place in May 1997. The company was just two years old, had precious few revenues and no profits. But Bezos was already calling Amazon Earth's biggest bookstore and hyping its potential to the sky. People were poo-pooing it as, wait a minute, it's just a bookstore, it's not profitable, it's going to run out of money and go out of business. And then you had a lot of other people saying, no, it's Dell, it's this tremendous new model and they're going to grow so quickly. And so right from the get-go, it was tremendously controversial. Any time that Jeff had the opportunity, he'd lower prices so that there would be more growth. And quite unlike many other business executives who hold their prices to uh, make more in profit. Now, truth be told, Bezos wasn't actually saying that profits didn't matter or that Amazon could go on losing money indefinitely. He was saying that in the formative gold rush land grab moment in the development of the web, profits could and should be sacrificed temporarily in favor of rapid growth. The strategy of Bezos boiled down to three simple words. Get big fast. Get big fast was really important for us. It was our critical strategy and the reason is we knew that we could offer customers a better experience if we had a certain amount of scale. Absolutely essential to getting big fast for Amazon was convincing customers to trust it with some of their most valuable personal information, their credit card numbers. And to understand how Amazon did that, we need to delve in to the age-old science of encryption. Powerful methods of scrambling messages mathematically had been developed long ago and employed most famously during World War II. But it was clear that something much more sophisticated was needed for the new digital age. The old method needed an upgrade because there was a fatal flaw. To explain this flaw, let's use a low-tech analogy using padlocks instead of mathematical encryption. First, imagine two people, and one wants to send a confidential message to the other. Just like a customer wanting to send her credit card to Amazon. Person one, the sender, puts her message in a box, locks it, and sends it off. But here's the snag. The sender of the message now also has to somehow let the recipient know the lock's combination, the code to unlock the padlock. This step is fraught with problems. This is when thieves could surreptitiously observe the code, steal it, and open up the box. Of course, if our sender and receiver already know each other, 
They could arrange to meet in secret before the message is sent and share the code. Unfortunately, of course, this mechanism is not of that much use in the context of online commerce. And the reason is, in online commerce, you want to enable confidential communication between pairs of parties who have no... Right? It's simply untenable for Amazon to have gone into a private room with every possible future customer of Amazon. So we needed a different plan. And that plan came from a trio of California-based mathematicians named Whitfield Diffie, Martin Hellman, and Ralph Merkel, who developed something called public key cryptography. Their scheme turned how encryption had been done for centuries on its head. Let's use our low-tech analogy again to explain the essential idea, which is brilliant, but kind of subtle. The sender puts a message in a box like before, but this time, instead of locking it with her own padlock, she asks the person who will receive the message to buy a padlock and send it to her. When the sender gets the padlock, she uses it to lock the box and then sends it. Now, if someone intercepts the box, they can't open it. In fact, even the sender can't open the box once it's locked. The only person who can open it is the intended recipient, the only person who has the code. Thus, presto, you have something close to perfect security. It took several years and some very clever math to create internet-friendly digital versions of the padlocks and boxes used in our analogy. But work it does, and public key cryptography is the linchpin of secure e-commerce. The public key is used for encrypting, that is, rendering secret, the data that the sender wishes to send confidentially to the receiver. Okay. There's also what's known as the private key, which is the combination used by the receiver in order to take the encrypted data, decrypt them, and produce the original message that's readable. With consumers flocking to Amazon on the basis of their confidence in secure, convenient e-commerce, Bezos had persuaded Wall Street to back his money-losing, get-big-fast strategy. But the internet boom that Amazon was part of still seemed tenuous. It progressed in fits and starts. The street still wasn't sure that the web wasn't just a fad. And companies like eBay did nothing to dispel that uncertainty, with its buyers and sellers trading in obscure collectibles that had been gathering dust in garages and attics around the country. I didn't know when I created eBay that there were all these collectors out there. I mean, I just, I, did, I didn't even know. You know, I'm not a business person. I didn't do the research to, to begin with. Initially, when eBay came out, you have a lot of investment managers would call up and they'd say, well, come on, it's just a tag sale. It's gross, and who wants to pay for these things that you can't see? We were telling the story about uh, people being basically good, people doing business with one another, and it was funny telling the story in New York City. You know, I mean, people were like, really? In the spring of 1998, Pierre and his investors realized they needed an A-list business person at the helm if they were going to get Wall Street to take eBay seriously. They found one in the person of Meg Whitman, a Harvard MBA who'd been a marketer at Walt Disney and a top executive at the toy company Hasbro. So we were really trying to define the company in terms of collectibles because 98% of the items on the site were in fact collectibles. In fact, 8% of the items on the site were actually Beanie Babies. Not a fact we widely shared. <laughs> eBay was scheduled to launch its public offering in September 1998, at a moment when the world economy was jittery because of that summer's Russian financial crisis. Would anyone want to buy shares in a company derisively referred to as Fleabay? I was slightly pessimistic. I thought, mm, you know, this is nothing's ever really worked out for me before, and this will be just another one of these situations. But not only did the IPO window open up for eBay, the company sailed right through it with an offering that was a success beyond anyone's expectations. eBay's stock soared that first day. By the end of it, the company was now valued at more than $2 billion. The issue was priced at $18 a share, and I think actually went public at $50 a share. My partner at the time was taking photographs of the television screen on CNBC every time the ticker would go by, because he just thought, well, my life has changed now forever. It's fantastic. Meanwhile, Wall Street was casting its eyes back at Amazon and liking what it was seeing. Leading the charge was Henry Blodgett, who toward the end of that year declared that despite still posting huge losses, Amazon shares would double within a year. 
I remember sitting on a flight back from Houston to New York with my spreadsheet in the back row and saying, okay, let's run the numbers again. And what actually is a reasonable case scenario for this stock over the next year? And I came out with a 300 to 500 dollar range and picked the middle one. Um, and I was actually shocked at the reaction. Blodgett's prediction caused a media sensation. And that sensation sparked a buying frenzy on Wall Street. The result was that Amazon's stock price did indeed double. Not in the course of a year, however, but in the space of just a few short weeks. That was probably the start of the actual manic bubble. The fits and starts of the internet bubble were now officially over, and the era of genuine and uncontrolled madness had begun. Suddenly, millions of Americans and investors around the world were stampeding to their brokers, snapping up shares in any company with a dot-com attached to its name, fueling the wildest speculative frenzy since the tulip mania in Amsterdam in the 17th century. The Amazon and eBay IPOs made Jeff Bezos and Pierre Omidyar richer than Crasis, on paper at least. But they also had an even larger effect. The IPOs made them famous. As their stories spread, they inspired legions of imitators, business school students from across the country, who suddenly started packing up their cars and heading for Silicon Valley. When I moved out to San Francisco at the start of 1998, the migration had barely begun. But by the end of that year, after eBay's IPO and the dawning awareness that the gyrations of the world economy weren't going to throttle the boom, a new gold rush was in full effect. You could practically see the hordes of dot-com prospectors streaming across the Bay Bridge, armed with laptops and half-baked business plans, rather than picks and shovels. And really, who could blame them? Judging by eBay and Amazon, it all seemed so easy. Sure, Bezos and Amidiar were smart and ambitious and monomaniacal, but so were countless MBAs from Harvard and Yale and Wharton. And it seemed as if all the old business strictures had melted into thin air. Experience? Who needed it? Profits? Please. It was a brave new world, a brand new economy, one where gravity and the rules of physics no longer seemed to hold sway. Among all the forces propelling the dot-com boom, none was more profound than the democratization of the stock market, taking the power away from Wall Street professionals, giving all of us the ability to buy and sell stocks from the comfort of our own homes. To a certain kind of person, this activity became a kind of obsession. They were called day traders, and they started making the stock market look like a low-rent casino. The day traders were buying stocks in the morning and selling them in the afternoon. And where did these day trading jokers get the information on which they based their ever so shrewd maneuvers? Well, they spent a lot of time absorbing gossip in internet stock chat rooms. But even more important, they spent every waking hour watching CNBC. It, it was like a national sport and an obsession in a way. And people who had never dreamed of buying stock before uh, were now just wading right into it. With the media and the markets now exhibiting an insatiable hunger for any company associated with e-commerce, it seemed that every software coder in the country was angling to quench that appetite. One such programmer was Philip Kaplan, who would later start a website that chronicled the foibles of the dot-com bubble. I would go out and do a pitch and, and literally walk out of the pitch with a $40,000 check, with a $100,000 check. There's just so much money being thrown around this thing. I was like, I can just put up a net and just, just catch, you know, just a little bit. The money flowed most freely in Silicon Valley, of course, where a culture of wretched self-promotional excess began to take hold. An online ticketing service based in San Francisco celebrated changing its name with a party for 3,000 people in an airplane hangar. People were just spending crazy amounts of money. I remember I, I wrote about a company that spent $10 million on their launch party. They had the Who perform and they had all these, all these, uh, they raised $12 million and spent $10 million on the party. Maybe the most lunatic expenditure of all were the TV ad campaigns. During the Super Bowl in 2000, more than a dozen internet startups spent an average of $2.2 million in 30-second spots, blowing $40 million in stockholder cash and not-so-hard-won venture capital. Tom Wolfe famously christened the 1980s the Me Decade. But by 1999, it was clear that the 90s had become the E-Decade. 
Virtually every day, it seemed, at least one new e-commerce venture was brought into the world. The kids running these new companies were all fervent disciples of the get big fast creed being preached by Amazon and eBay. But when embraced by lesser minds, these theories led to an ungodly amount of sheer stupidity and to a bunch of Me Too knockoff companies with incredibly silly names. There was Pets.com, there was PetSmart, there was Petstopia. There were iPrint and iBeam, iMany, iGo, and iVillage. Then there were the E's, E-Pre's, E-Greetings, E-Merge, E-Funds, E-Loan, E-College, and of course Epiphany. There was FireDog and FirePond, Razorfish, and LoudEye. <laughs> Few of these companies had any plausible reason for existing, let alone a basic grasp of strategy or economics. It was a very charged, very energetic, uh, nearly frantic time when it was easy to uh, lose your uh, bearings and some of your judgment. Now you might wonder why the Valley's genius venture capitalists were funding all these derivative, dopey, and entirely hopeless outfits. Were they crazy? Greedy? Well, maybe a little of both. What they were really doing, though, was hedging their bets. They knew full well that most of the e-commerce dot-coms were doomed from birth, but they thought that one in every category might survive or even thrive, and they were willing to risk a couple million bucks so that they wouldn't mess out on the big score. We're playing, you know, with uh, fire, but you kind of had to, or you couldn't be in the game. But what about the professional money managers on Wall Street? Didn't they realize that we were in the midst of a lunatic speculative bubble? Most people were thinking, okay, no, they're not all going to survive, but we don't know exactly who is and how long it's going to take. And in the meantime, the punishment we are taking for not owning the sector, for sitting here and saying, someday it's going to crash, is a lot of us are getting fired. Blodgett knew that a lot of e-commerce companies were fundamentally unsound. But his argument was that this wasn't necessarily a good reason not to buy their stocks. The trouble for him was that on occasion, he put his unvarnished views of these outfits into private emails. And that would later come back to haunt him when the bubble popped. You know, remember the Henry Blodgett email where he wrote this thing? He said, you know, this piece of company, but we have to recommend it. You know, he was, he was an analyst inside investment bank. He knew the company was garbage, and yet he was recommending it because that was how they made their money. You know, he actually got in trouble, but in a way, in a sense, he was actually one of the few honest people in the whole process. The internet boom had now officially turned into a speculative bubble. But it wasn't the only financial mania happening at the time. A second one, closely related, was in telecommunications. Dozens of companies were racing to stick thousands of miles of fiber optic cable into the ground to accommodate the swelling demand for bandwidth that made the internet go. To understand why this is important, it's time again for a little bit of tech talk. Like most internet technology, fiber optics relies on the extraordinary properties of ordinary materials. The silicon chip ultimately starts as sand, and fiber optic cable is made from either glass or plastic. Fiber is essentially a strand of glass as thin as a human hair, which carries beams of light. Light travels in straight lines, but fiber bends and twists for thousands of miles, so you would expect the light to shoot out at the first bend. Well, to stop this from happening, fiber is coated with a kind of mirrored surface, which keeps the light inside. But how exactly do rays of light enable the transmission of text and pictures and videos and emails and all the rest? It uses an idea of great simplicity that dates back to the days when ships at sea had to find a way to communicate. They would flash lights at one another using Morse code. A combination of long flashes and short flashes would then be decoded into letters of the alphabet. That's pretty much how fiber uses light to carry information. The light isn't a continuous stream. It's a stream of pulses representing the ones and zeros that comprise computer code. But while a Morse code operator might be at best able to send one or two flashes a second, fiber optic cables can carry some 10 billion pulses of digital information every second. Now, the question you might ask is, how did the internet cope with this massive explosion in users and data? Why didn't it just grind to a halt? The answer lies in an extremely clever, though simple idea that all of us are familiar with, but in a different context. It turns out that data is directed around the internet 
in much the same way that road signs direct car drivers around the road network. Here's how it works. Let's say that you start out in New York and you want to drive to Boston. So when you're far away from Boston, what you see on road signs is Boston, keep right. On the big roads, you just learn, know about big destinations. On the smaller roads, you learn about progressively smaller destinations. Okay, so now how do we make all of this fit onto the internet? It turns out, if I'm in San Francisco or New York, and I want to get to Harvard on the internet, I don't need to know which computer at Harvard I want to go to, because when I'm that far away, the only thing I care about is that I'm making progress toward that one gateway that goes to all of Harvard. Useful? Totally. But the problem was the firms that were laying all this fiber got way ahead of themselves. There was too much building, too much spending, too many companies doing the same thing as each other, with no thought for costs or consequences. 1999 was a wild year, almost impossible to fathom now. From the start of the boom in 1995, there had never been more than 30 internet companies to go public in any given year. In 1999, the total number of internet IPOs was 250. But eBay and Amazon stood head and shoulders above the rest of the dot-com crowd. eBay's market value on the NASDAQ was now $21 billion, and it was even profitable. It was very unreal from a stock market point of view, and that worried me a lot, because you have to remember I was in my early 40s. I'd been around business for 20 years, and I knew that this wasn't quite right. So it was really more the headiness of those times where, you know, with the market cap get way ahead of what the company could actually deliver, there was no basis in fundamentals, and I was worried about that. And while Bezos' company couldn't say the same, it was racking up sales of $1.6 billion a year, and its own market cap was a staggering $37 billion. Jeff was always saying to us, actually, do not keep your eye on the stock price, which I think was very intelligent of him. You know, do your job here the best you can, do everything you can for the company. I never said to myself, gee, you know, I'm the $10 million book reviewer, because there was clearly such a disconnect between the job you were doing and the rewards you were getting that, you know, there was something, a continued, uh, you know, sort of nimbus of unreality floating around the whole thing. Now, as the turn of the millennium drew near, Jeff Bezos was given an accolade that in the past had been accorded to the likes of Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Adolf Hitler. He was named Time Magazine's Person of the Year as the embodiment of e-commerce. For Bezos, this was quite an honor, a sign that he'd been elevated into the pantheon of American business icons. But more cynical minds read it another way, as a sign that the end was nigh. The epicenters of the internet bubble may have been Silicon Valley and Wall Street, but there was one central player who resided in Washington, D.C., the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, Alan Greenspan. Though Greenspan famously said that irrational exuberance was fueling the bubble, he'd done precious little during the 1990s to try and prick it. Greenspan believed that technology was creating a new economy, one where the old rules no longer applied. But after witnessing the stock market's crazy run-up in 1999, and after glimpsing signs that the overall economy was dangerously close to overheating, Greenspan decided that the time had finally come to cool things down. In February of 2000, and then again in March, the Fed raised interest rates to their highest level since 1995, moves that signaled that Greenspan was now determined to put the bubble to an end. At the same time that Greenspan was making his moves, Wall Street began to train a more sober eye on its dot-com darlings. The holiday season that many had expected to bring a rush of revenues into the e-commerce companies had proved a major disappointment. Suddenly, Wall Street began to doubt the wisdom of Get Big Fast and to suspect that many of the web retailers were nothing but a house of cards, something that programmer and messed up company chronicler Philip Kaplan had known for some time. There would be e-commerce sites that we would build where I know that the, the client would have spent two, three, four million dollars on these websites. I'd log into the database every now and then and see they had like, you know, $20 worth of sales, $25 worth of sales, $100 worth of sales. On April 14th, 1912, the Titanic had its fateful collision with an iceberg and dropped to the bottom of the ocean. And exactly 88 years later, to the day, the internet economy met a similar fate on what would forever after be known on Wall Street as Black Friday, 
the Nasdaq fell an astonishing 355 points, bringing to an awful end a week in which the index had fallen by more than 25 percent, the single greatest collapse in the history of the stock market. 18 months after Black Friday, September 11th happened, thus bringing to a conclusive end the long boom that had buoyed the American and indeed the world economy during the 1990s. From its peak above 5,000, the Nasdaq had lost more than two-thirds of its value. Even the most venerable high-tech giants, such as Intel and Sun Microsystems, were now walking wounded, and countless dot-com wunderkinds were now pushing up the daisies. Webvan, dead. Excited Home, dead. Theglobe.com, Pets.com, Boo.com, dead, dead, dead. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross famously said that in the face of death, there are five stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. But when it comes to the demise of stock market bubbles, there's an additional stage that comes before acceptance, recrimination. The mourners feel ripped off by the deceased, so they look for someone else to blame, which in this case meant Wall Street. On behalf of irate shareholders, New York's then Attorney General, Elliot Spitzer, launched a crusade to reform the IPO industry and punish its supposed villains. His most famous target was Martha Stewart, but coming in a close second was our old friend, Henry Blodgett. Obviously people are angry, people lost a ton of money. Using the critical emails that Blodgett sent as evidence, the US Securities and Exchange Commission charged Blodgett with civil securities fraud. He settled without admitting or denying the allegations and was banned from the securities industry for life. Unfortunately, I can't go into a lot of detail on the emails, but certainly at, from a, a larger perspective, yes, I, I rode the internet wave up incredibly. I was incredibly fortunate in terms of the timing of, of my being there, and I was optimistic about the right companies at the right time, and so I saw a tremendous benefit from the boom, and then I think I've probably more than any other analyst felt the brunt of the crash, which was like hitting the rocks full speed. Five years later, the bitterness over the dot-com bubble has subsided. Acceptance has set in. But for most people looking back on it, the bubble still seems like a moment of temporary insanity, in which lots of good people got fleeced by a bunch of digital future hustlers. All in all, a very bad thing. But there is, in fact, another school of thought one imbued with a greater sense of historical perspective and economic logic. One that sees the bubble as having had its virtues and the pain it caused as the price we pay for progress. The great dot-com crash of 2000 and 2001 was indeed great by any standard. Some three and a half trillion dollars in paper wealth evaporated in the space of one year. But it was hardly a unique event. When the railway bubble popped, railroad stocks lost 85% of their value almost overnight. And the collapse of the automobile, canal, and telegraph bubbles caused panic and recession too. But out of those bubbles came mass communications and the road and railway networks that are so crucial to our daily lives. The same has proven to be the case with e-commerce. A jillion dumdum.coms may have perished, but a handful of companies have not only survived, but turned into hugely profitable behemoths. You could say, in fact, that Amazon and eBay are the Ford and GM of the web economy. What Amazon and what eBay did was fundamentally different, and they did it early, they did it aggressively, and they did it extremely well, recognizing that the customer experience was paramount. And that's why they exist today and are the global multinational corporations. The lessons of both eBay and Amazon, indeed, are that the most successful e-commerce companies did more than just use the web to sell stuff. They understood that you have to use it to get power to ordinary people in ways that are fundamentally different from the old top-down, one-way, one-dimensional, one-size-fits-all mass production ethos that dominated business in the pre-web economy. A business like eBay is all about empowering the people, regular people, to use the tools uh, in the way that they see fit. And then sort of, you know, stepping back, getting out of the way, and letting, letting the people run with it. Though the details are different, Amazon's approach is similarly about the empowerment of its customers, even when that empowerment sometimes annoys its suppliers. Consider, for example, Amazon's policy of letting readers add uncensored book reviews to the site. Once, I heard Bezos talk about the complaints he received from publishers on this score. What if people trashed the books, they said to Bezos. 
Surely that would be bad for business. That's where you're wrong, Bezos told the publishers. You're in the business of selling books. We're in the business of satisfying our customers. The most important thing for me about you know what uh, people could say about Amazon.com at some point, 50 years or 100 years in the future, what I would love to hear is that we set a new standard for customer service. What made the survivors survive is uh, first uh, a deep understanding and a relentless focus on their customers. Well, what about the losers, you might ask? Surely all the pain and suffering and the decimation of wealth outweighed the survival of a few perennials. At the depths of the crash, I put that question to Andy Grove, the legendary chairman of Intel. Grove is a congenital skeptic, and during the dot-com bubble, there had been no louder naysayer. But now Grove argued that the bubble had actually been a good thing. What this incredible valuation craze did, he said, was draw untold sums of billions of dollars into building out the internet infrastructure, everything from fiber optic cable to Amazon's customer database. And while that infrastructure would probably have been built anyway, he went on, it happened over five years instead of 15, a huge advantage to America and the world. Grove also made another argument, that the dot-coms had performed an invaluable service by putting the fear of God into brick-and-mortar firms, by forcing them to get serious about the web, to turn themselves into internet companies almost against their will. So the dot-coms didn't die in vain, I asked? No, Grove replied. The dot-coms threw themselves on the bonfire, but they created a bigger flame as a result. Many jobs were lost, you know, companies failed. But it's also true that out of that, many uh, new companies were created, became durable, and, and, and the economy was genuinely transformed. The concept of creative destruction is famous in economics, and it seems an apt description of what happened in the dot-com era and what's happening now. First a wave of innovation, then a financial mania, then a terrible crash, followed by a golden age built on what remains. Arising out of the dot-com ashes and the successes of Amazon and eBay are a new breed of companies run by a new breed of entrepreneurs. Who are these entrepreneurs? They're the people who were burned before. And so they have that, that experience to make sure that they don't make the same mistakes again. I think it's just, this is what the internet's all about. The internet's about connecting individuals or connecting individuals to information. Outside Silicon Valley, it's true. You won't find as much consensus that we're entering a digital golden age. But in a way, that may be the strongest testament to how far the web, and e-commerce in particular, have come in the past decade. The futurist John Seeley Brown once observed that when a technology achieves amenity, when it becomes ubiquitous and essential, it disappears, it becomes invisible. Think of electricity, think of airplanes and automobiles and air conditioning. Like the railroad tracks crisscrossing the country, the web is becoming the foundation of our economy, carrying us along to our destination so smoothly and efficiently, we don't even realize how fast we're moving.